Why are you here? I'm looking for a great warrior. So what kind of warrior have you been? The way of the warrior. He needed a warrior's mind. Clearly this was all planned by warriors of warriors. Now is the time. Warrior of Impact podcast. We are streaming live in our Facebook group and coming to you uh, live wherever you listen to podcasts. So I just want to do like a quick recap of our first episode because I think we covered a ton. And we did. After listening back to it, uh, I, I realized how much we really went into and in one episode to cover that much, I think is a uh, a pretty good foundation, right? Like I think that to be able to identify you know, what we're even doing, why we're here, what we're talking about was just a really great way to kick this off. And then obviously we're going to do that today a little bit more. And and next week, as uh, uh, we go into my story and really help bring it full circle for the warrior, um, but wanted to kind of like save some of this space real quick and, and kind of chat and, you know, get some of your feedback from how you felt last week went and what were your biggest takeaways, Shannon? I really enjoyed last week. I think for me, it was a revelation that I really enjoy this kind of um, platform that I wasn't sure I was kind of, you know, a little iffy about it, whether, but I really enjoyed it. It's, it, made me a lot less nervous than I thought it would be. And I feel like for myself, it's a big push because, you know, we're taking our own advice. We're doing the actual thing that we tell people to do, which is to just start where you are and really embrace who you are, what you are, and just be more visible. Yeah. I think that it certainly elevates our conviction. Mm -hmm. You know, I think that, it was it was a really cool opportunity to really lay it all out uh, the blueprint, and, yeah. and I think that the fact that we are able to recognize just how much we live into that, I think really accelerates what we're trying to do here on this platform with the podcast. It's okay. I know for myself, and you're going to hear a lot about that today and and next week about you know how I've gotten to a place of identifying as a warrior, and then to take that and really live into it so much so that our entire team does. And then the right. people that we work with, and, and it really just allows us to uh, to radiate in, in that the meaning of being a warrior, uh, living out what it means to be a warrior and sharing that with others and really um, inspiring people to to make that change and to live into that. And I feel like by putting that out there in that foundation of, you know, hey, this is these are the elements. These are these are what it takes to be a warrior based off of the trajectory that we're going to explain by doing that. And then now going forward and talking with people, it just gives me the like, I don't know, it fills me up with so much joy that we get to to really dissect some of these things that um, a lot of people will never talk about in their life. They, they, they don't think about what these things do on a day-to-day -day basis in their daily life. And so by being able to be in this position to, uh, to challenge that and to challenge people in, you know, and I think this is a positive form of challenge. Like I'm going to challenge you to just see just how amazing you really are. I think it also gives us the opportunity to let people know that even if your own life, you don't think about yourself as a warrior. I hope that we give people reason to see that they really are, that each and every one of us has that warrior spirit. And even if you think what you do or who you are isn't important, that each and every one of us has an impact on someone else. And so we all have it within us already to be a warrior. Absolutely. Absolutely. And so I think that is a perfect segue to really kind of starting uh, what we're going to talk about today. In preparing for this episode, I recognize that I have not really shared my story in this full capacity um, since really launching uh, the coaching business. Like I think we've done like right. some like Reader's Digest versions of it and really given snippets here, but it's been years since I've laid out my entire story. So I want to spend some time today really going through what started this whole thing. You know, my journey right. of uh, my journey to at least understanding what it means to be a warrior and really recognizing the strength. Um, and then next week, 
what I want to do is be able to connect the dots and really be able to share how the strength that I talk about finding today was put into a position that figured out what to do with it. And that's ultimately how we got to where we are. So we're kind of doing this a little out of order, you know, last week, you know, we kind of set the precedent. Now we're going to kind of do, uh, these are kind of the prefaces. This is how we've gotten to where we are. So right. kind of jump around a little bit just cause, uh, you know, I want to make sure that I cover as much as we can today. Um, but we'll kind of just get right into it. And then, you know, if you, know, you want to put in your insight, we'll, uh, we'll make that happen. So, um, kind of the overall view is that, you know, a lot of my journey, a lot of my um, path has been a health journey. Uh, when I was born um, at seven months pregnant, my parents found out that uh, I have a heart issue and they weren't under, they didn't really understand the the severity of it, uh, but they would, you know, do the, the testing. And, you know, as a mom, you know, I'm sure you can recognize that, you know, that heart wrenching approach to, you know, recognize that, Hey, your child's not going to be normal. And that's what we want for our children. You know, I'm, I'm a parent too. Right. You want your child to be healthy. Um, and so at seven months pregnant, you know, or, or maybe, maybe around that area, um, they, they gave my parents the option. They were like, your child's not going to survive the birth. And so they gave them the option to have a medical abortion knowing that, you know, there's no way this child's going to survive this. His, his heart's growing abnormally. He has tumors on the inside of his heart that are bigger than parts of the heart. So they gave him the option. And, um, my parents, they kind of had this renewed sense of faith, I guess they were young. I was their first child. They were, you know, young and in love and, and trying to face the world and I think recognize that it was going to be easy, but for whatever reason decided to, you know, to give me that opportunity and chance, you know, uh, I, I guess that they didn't want to be the, de the decision makers in that sense. And so they decided to go forward. And so, uh, July 21st, 1983 at 4 21 PM on a rainy Thursday, uh, this <laughs> beautiful thing right here was born. <laughs> um, but it was not without complication. Obviously it was, um, so real to look back and see. So I have cover, uh, I have newspaper articles from when I was on the cover of uh, New York Times, Daily Post, all of the major news outlets covered it. Um, miracle baby born. Uh, and, and it's in hindsight, really cool to look back at. But at the same time, it's when I can recognize now when I kind of had my cross to bear. How do you think you're, how do you think your parents were able to deal with that? Um, I can imagine myself. I um, I was right at my due date and uh, I couldn't feel Anya move. That's my daughter. And I know I was terrified. And, you know, I was only a few days away from giving birth. I can only imagine what your parents went through. So were you premature? Um, I was just a little premature, but uh, mm -hmm. I was kind of intentional, uh, but it wasn't premature in the sense that I was going to be any more at risk. Right. So um, I, I don't know. I don't know how to answer. I think, you know, what I've learned as a parent is um, you kind of you just do. Right. Like we don't have it. Yeah. Out. Like you kind of uh, th there's not a lot of times in your life where I think you can you can get away with the I'll figure it out mentality <laughs> but i think as parents that's all we can do you know you can prepare in, you can you can do all these things but you know it's i'll figure it out we'll do it live <laughs> <laughs> going going back to last week i guess when every year i guess every parent takes a leap of faith right mm -hmm. yeah and i have to imagine that that's what it was for them it was we're having this child I mean, that was just it for them and so i was uh born and then kept in the hospital for a very long time. I had this uh, issue breathing, you know, obviously, you know, matters with the heart, you know, it affected my respiratory system. I wasn't breathing. I was developing fairly normal, but um, otherwise, you know, I had the, a tumor the size of a softball inside of my heart. Now think about that as a newborn with, you know, your heart only being so small and having, you know, this large tumor on the inside that's taking up a large portion of the heart. And so in and out of the hospital, and then I had my first surgery at 16 months where they went in and took that tumor out. I'm going to do my best to try to stay away from a lot of like medical terminology because it, it just can get confusing. But, you know, the idea being that they went in 
and the right side of my heart, which is my right tricuspid valve, which is where really kind of like is the power plant kind of area for the right side of your heart was blocked off by this tumor. So they went in and took that out and really just kind of monitored me at a young age. I was very frail, you know, didn't really gain weight very well, always had this issue with uh, breathing. And by seven, the scar tissue from the original tumor removal actually started affecting the way that the heart was functioning. And so um, I had to go in for surgery. The surgery kind of was uh, the first pivotal point of my warrior journey. So I want to kind of just pause there for a second. Um, a couple of months before my surgery at seven years old, my grandfather had passed away. Now, I've been blessed with two larger than life grandfathers. They were the... Uh, epitome of what it meant to be a man. They are these like fictional character-esque, you know, figures that were in my life. You know, both of them were uh, Navy veterans. You know, one grandfather was an architect that, you know, was involved with a lot of the projects of the New York skyline. Then my other grandfather was a New York City police officer. You know, he, you know, he was out, he was a fisherman. He uh, was involved with the project to put the antenna on the top of the Empire State Building. So really just these larger than the light, they, they were like my Paul Bunyan-esque figures. And so I was <laughs> right. friends with my grandfathers. Like they, they literally have both taught me uh, you know, they, they laid the foundation for, you know, what it meant to be a man. And and ultimately, like my, my one of my grandfathers really taught me uh, my love for storytelling. And so uh, my grandfather, and this is one of my earliest memories, my grandfather, my mom's father passed away when I was seven years old. And I remember like, you know, just sitting at the top of the stairs, recognized because they took him off in an ambulance, like just knowing he wasn't coming back, but also at the same time, knowing that I was going to see him again, which is maybe a little eerie, <laughs> but uh <laughs> I think that that's some wisdom, you know, as a child, we don't really comprehend, you know, what it means. Well, a couple of months later, had my surgery at seven years old, I died during the operation. And uh, to the point where I can vividly remember kind of coming out of my body, recognizing, kind of looking down, seeing the make and model of the, the bandsaw that they used to cut my chest open with. And and being able to like just vividly be super aware of the surroundings. And so, and then I just kind of like went somewhere. And the best interpretation that I can give for people is I truly believe that it was heaven, but it wasn't walking on clouds with an old man with a gray beard. What it really was, was this surrounding of warmth and energy. And um, I was whole. I wasn't a sick child, like my body wasn't there, but it was right. very much, it was my soul, which had a physical feeling to it, but it was a physical feeling of energy uh, that is connected to everything. I was, I was one with everything and just fully connected. Um, and I remember just feeling whole, feeling healthy, feeling, you know, in a lot of ways, like what we all strive for in that, you know, in that sense of just like vitality of, you know, connectiveness. And I was cured most of all. When you were a kid, like between 16 months and seven years, did you have a lot of health problems? Oh yeah. Yeah. I mean, it was always constant. I was in, you know, in so you were sick all the time, always, always dealing with, you know, struggles of like the heart issues, pain. And then I've been on medicine my whole life. So the, like those medicine side effects affect you in different ways. And so I remember, you know, it being in this place of wholeness and energy. And then I remember feeling a presence and again, explaining it. Um, it sounds like I saw somebody, which it's, I guess that's the best way to comprehend it, but really it is a meeting of like energies. Like, um, so I saw my grandfather. That's that's like, you know, the, the long story short in that sense. But it wasn't like sitting next to a best friend. It was being in the presence of somebody from the emotional standpoint. Like think about like when you're with somebody, the emotional charge that we give off. It was that, but magnified. And then I remember there being like a greater power of warmth that was blanketing and covering both of us. The best way I can say it is like I felt home. Like home right, in, the but you in, the, in the truest, purest form. But you weren't scared. It wasn't a feeling of being scared. It no, wasn't. no, no. It wasn't scary at all. And I think that what I recognized was that's where I wanted to be. It's where I wanted to stay. I remember that I wanted to stay there. I wanted to stay in this in this wholeness, in this feeling of uh, 
you know, who I am, who I'm supposed to be in this, you know, in this, this, this life, this world. And my grandfather, and I remember this vividly saying, no, you are meant for more. And woke up and, uh, as an excitable seven year old, <laughs> I, I saw a grandpa. And just like, and, and the thing is, like, I never, like, never, like, nobody really questioned it, but they also at the same time, they're like, okay, you know, uh, but I was so concise with my story that the doctors were like, yeah, you know, you flatline the table for over five minutes. Uh, yeah. Which is a long time. Uh, but obviously, if you're ever going to, you're ever gonna die do it in the environment to where you can be brought back and you're under the care of and supervision of doctors you know? uh, and and i for one am very glad you came back <laughs> yes 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 but what uh, but what 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 came from that is and, and i recognize this especially in hindsight is that changes everything right there right right from the moment of seven years old i've had this echo chamber you're meant for more so now let's catch up here at one years old I get this title of being a miracle. Then at seven years old, it's this, this emphasis of being meant for more, right? That's a lot of pressure to put on somebody because I'm a big fan of the titles that we bestow on ourselves versus the titles that are bestowed upon us. And I think that these are two immeasurable titles that, you know, are, are, are you know, essentially pushed on somebody. And they are ones that, I don't think somebody could really declare somebody can say, you know, from a, from a factual base, a scientific base, like a miracle, like what is a miracle, you know? Right. Uh, um, and then the same with, you know, saying, I think that the resonance of your meant for more, you know, is, uh, it's probably where I held more onto. And so then at eight years old, my family uh, and I, uh, we moved to North Carolina or shortly before eight. And I had uh, another heart surgery. And this one was to replace the valve that had been getting all this damage all this time. The one where they went in at seven to try to, you know, to fix the, you know, kind of get the scar tissue. They put a secure ring around it. Um, and so I had, you know, this. And so I've, I've had these life lessons, obviously, from every surgery. These are monumental surgeries. These are crack your chest open, you know, recover for months, years, if not at a time. So right. it's hard not to like, you know, especially in reflection, look back. And so at eight years old, you know, I had just moved to North Carolina with my family, started third grade and um, halfway through the year I had to have the surgery. And so I met one of my many angels on earth at that point uh, in my third grade teacher. Uh, and we talk about impact. You know, obviously my grandfather's made a lot of impact on my lives. And uh, this was, I feel like there's other people that, you know, that have made impacts in my life that are not family up until this point. But this, uh, my, my, my third grade teacher, Mrs. Congleton, demonstrated in a way that I would say, you know, really created more of the path to where I am now, the path of service to others. So that I didn't have to be left back at third grade. She would drive from Holly Springs to Duke Hospital every afternoon uh, on her own account and teach me. So that way I didn't have to get left back in school. And now at the time, we didn't have the highway. And the so, I mean, you're talking like some days, you know, after a long school day, another two hour drive out from Holly Springs to Durham. Um, and then, you know, her and her husband would stay out there and, you know, sit with our family. And uh, she did that for months. And I never forgot that. And and so we obviously developed this long-term bond over the years. But um, I think that this is a great example of the beauty that can come from tragedy. You know, it's kind of looking at what people do. Because, um, I mean, the surgery was obviously a major surgery, but, you know, I survived that. I, I you know, I was able to get through that. It's, it's the, it's what transpired around me that oftentimes, you know, kept me going and kept me realizing like, wow, there's a lot of uh, beauty in, in all of this. And I remember, you know, going through the recovery process at that age and I went for one follow-up appointment and we're, <laughs> we're driving to Duke because back in the day, you just had to go right to the main hospital for your, uh, there wasn't a lot of satellite campuses and things like that. And, <laughs> and uh, this is, this is how powerful a manifestor I am for better or for worse. My <laughs> mom and I were driving in the car and we, we passed the exit and it says, Duke trauma. And I was like, 
mom, what is trauma? You know? <laughs> and so like that, see, like an exit before the main hospital that we'd go and, and she explained, you know, kind of like the, it's the equivalent of like emergency and things like that. And so we go do the, you know, the, the checkup um, and we get home. And when we get home, of course, there's no cell phones at this time. You're we talking like early nineties. There's a message on the voicemail uh, on the box and it's uh, Mrs. Roland, we need you to bring Michael back to Duke immediately for emergency open heart surgery. Um, so we went right to the trauma center <laughs> like that. I had, you know, so, so conveniently asked about earlier in that day. Well, it turns out my body rejected the uh, valve and it was not, uh, not doing well. It clotted over and, and it was having issues. And so went in um, only a couple of uh, months later, had the fourth open heart surgery um, to try to clear this up. Now, luckily after this surgery, I was able to kind of begin to navigate uh, the equivalency of like a normal childhood. You know, I think. Right. So you, so you were able to be more active, have a better quality of life, get out. Yeah, do things. So, um, active is a little hard. So I, uh, I was a make a wish kid. So okay. after then, uh, we had, uh, I had my make a wish and it, you know, well, what do you want? So I've always had this like athletic drive, but I was not like, I had to stop playing baseball when we moved down here at eight years old because, um, I couldn't go into fast pitch just because they were so, they were concerned about, you know, I you know, get hit in the chest. I was just going to say if that ball hits you. Yeah. So uh, I had to stop doing that. And um, so I wanted to, to do something. And so I, I remember watching something at a young age and getting introduced to, um, to Mark Spitz, uh, Olympic swimmer with a heart problem. And I was like, Somebody like me, yeah. right? Because we, I, we I was, when we find people that identify us like that, we we tend to get drawn towards that. And so, uh, I was going to say that must have been a big inspiration for you. Well, it was because you know uh, up until that point, and so I, uh, I had known a couple of other people with my condition, which is a rare condition. But um, at that point, they'd all died. Yeah, scary. I, you know, I met other kids and it was, uh, and it was a matter of kind of always bracing ourselves for, for when, not if, you know, yeah. situations, uh, which is scary, you know, obviously. And, and how do you have a childhood where you have this, you have death lingering over your shoulder, you know, it's hard. And so saw Mark Spitz got really, you know, into swimming and my make a wish was a pool. And, um, I was out there and I, and I would swim like crazy. And, and that was, and that was our summertime. It was able to, you know, have a place where the kids can all come in the neighborhood we would all, you know, have fun. And, and that developed into having like a, as close to normal childhood as possible. Um, so they built you a pool. Yeah. They came in and built, uh, the pool. They leveled out the yard. I mean, they did a fantastic job and they, they really took care of us, uh, and making me feel you know, like a normal kid, which is, you know, really what That's the awesome. goal is. Um, and, and make a wish is a fantastic organization. Um, I've, I've had the pleasure as I've gotten older to do some work with them, give back and be involved with some, uh, some of the charity, uh, you know, events and, and hold some charity events myself, just cause I think that they are just, uh, they do it right. And I think we oftentimes forget that value of just being a kid. And that's why I'm trying to yeah. emphasize the fact that like, I did have a point in my life where I, I got to kind of feel normal because the goal is not to ignore the issue. It's to make everything else around it be that much more powerful that it's not what you have to focus on. Right. And I think in a lot of ways that is the mission of make a wish is to, is to let kids know that they have their own value. They have their life that means so much. Um, and, and, it's a token. It's a gesture. Oftentimes it's like buying them something. It's doing something making a day about them, fulfilling a wish, which, um, doesn't ever do justice to the, to the, the struggle, but there's still so much more power in, in, you know, in that of, of, you know, being like, there's a moment where I felt like a child. And, and, and I can say that there was a number of years like that. And, uh, and I'm blessed to have that, you know, to, to have had, you know, that, that opportunity for that. Um, 
you know, I think as I got into my middle school and high school years, um, I tried to ignore the fact that I was sick or had issues because uh, I was good for long enough. Like we'd have these, you know, issues come up and every now and then usually it could be fixed with medicine and stuff like that. But uh, I kind of rebelled against it. You know, uh, I knew my limits and oftentimes uh, I would step on or over that line. I'll never forget my mom almost killing me when she found out that I went bungee jumping. She's like, <laughs> yeah, you're not supposed to do that. Like, you know, it's, it's like, I'm going to kill you for, for almost killing yourself in that sense. But uh, I, I think that part of me became this rebel of like, I don't want to feel controlled. I don't want this to control me. Um, and to an extent, like I still have that mindset. I'm just a lot more uh, maybe cautious uh, or I think so. Then I go and free climb 700 foot, you know, face of a mountain, you know, but it's not. Did your parents, when, when you were younger, did they kind of keep you um, insulated? Very careful yeah. about what you did and kind of bubble wrapped you. Yeah. So very much like the John Travolta boy in the bubble, you know, very. Uh, so I think that as I was younger, um, you know, there was like, you know, it was almost like coddled a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that I resisted that, you know, because, you know, yeah. I'm, the oldest, I'm the oldest of five. So it's like and I'm the and luckily I'm the only one that's sick. But there is, you know, it's it's hard to do that. And, you know, never was resentful, never anything like that, but definitely recognized. And it, it was definitely recognized throughout the whole family that I was different or that I was dealing with something. And so um, the funny thing about life is that the moment you think you've got, you know, things kind of figured out and things are going, you know, one way um, at the drop of a dime, everything can change. You know, absolutely. And I think that's that, for any of us, for any of us, you could, you know, and, and it's, you know, it's driving to work and getting a flat tire and that, you know, being the reason why we didn't get into the accident, maybe, or, you know, we don't understand like, you know, the hand that, you know, the divine has on us. And, and so like, I've always had, um, and tried to find some solace in the fact that like, you know, juggling the everything happens for me uh, uh everything happens for a reason and juggling that with like you know being able to have like our own manifested destiny you know I think there's a balance right. right i think you know a lot of the ways we are the sum of our actions but the opportunities that are put in front of us you know they're they're there for a reason right i think a lot of people struggle with that um that kind of free will versus predestination. And I, I mean, it's, it's something we could probably spend a whole episode on, but it definitely is something I think that most people struggle with as to whether free choice really, really defines where we're going or were we always meant to go where we end up. Right. Exactly. And I think that it's, it's those blindside moments where we, you know, we get comfortable, right? Right. Um, and I think that once we get comfortable, that's why, like, then that causes us to react differently, right? Um, like, we think something is being taken from us or we're being, you know, uh, called out or it's, it's like being attacked us. It's like, well, no, um, you, you, just, you just let down your guard. You, you, you know, it, it's not so much you, it's like, you know, like life, you know, it's, uh, life gets in the way of, of life a lot of times, you know, it's, uh, it's the Jeff Goldblum, uh, yeah. it's the Jeff Goldblum life finds a way, you know, it's, it's always going to find its way to do what it, it's supposed to do. Um, and then, and then we can act and react. Well, um, at 19, I went in for what was supposed to be a normal checkup. Uh, only to find out that I had um, my valve had clotted over. And so they put me into the hospital um, and tried to treat it with medicine, you know, um, which has its own set of problems. Like obviously like, you know, to do a intravenous blood thinner um, and they were really trying to dilute and flood this tumor out uh, or this clot out, sorry. And, 
they just recognized after a couple of days, like it's not going to happen. It, you know, at this point, like, you know, they, they'd given me, you know, direct like heparin drip to the point where I had a pick line in, I had two IVs and they were just like trying to flood the system, trying to break this, uh, this up and it just wasn't working. So they, uh, they made the call to go forward with surgery and, um, that must have terrified your parents with you being on blood thinners and everything else you had going on. I would be beside myself. <laughs> yeah. So this was uh, as much as that seven, like, so I think the seven year old Michael is when really um, the warrior's voice was first heard. You're meant for more. It's the first time the the voice was like heard. And at 19, I think is when, um, the test of its resolve is really put forward because uh, during my surgery, when they were clearing the heart lung machine, an air bubble went through uh, causing me to have an embolism, having a stroke during the surgery. So I woke up from surgery and I was uh, paralyzed on the left side of my body. And I remember uh, them trying to figure out, they do like the normal cognitive function and stuff. And, you know, it's squeeze, squeeze, you know, push this, push, push this foot. And I'll just never forget them saying, all right, kick your right foot, kick my right foot. And they're like, kick your left foot. And then I kick with my right foot. They're like, no, your left foot. And, and, and like I said, I am, I am. And so this while, like, you know, I'm coming out of that, that twilight of, uh, you know, the anesthesia and in a, in a, bunch of pain because they'd recognize that something was wrong but they they couldn't quite determine it and um what they wound up having to do was essentially put me back into a, a medically induced coma because with the air bubble in my brain they couldn't give me any pain medicine they couldn't right. give me the traditional treatment of a post-operative patient because they couldn't really play around with the chemical makeup they had to make sure that they were treating this new issue uh so kind of like recovery had to kind of wait and so i was in and out of this medically induced coma um and 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 after i found like uh they did not think that i was going to make it to the point where my parents had uh, already started to make funeral arrangements and I remember um, I, they would they would bring me out to do these tests and then they immediately put me back in. And I remember one time coming out of my uh, my coma and and just kind of looking around and scanning the room and now breathing tubes. And so it's not like I was communicating. It was just me being aware. And I looked and I scanned the room and all I saw was my family crying. And just like trying to hold it together and trying to show their strength. And it was it was detrimental to know that you're causing this pain. But it's not that I was causing the pain, right? But it's to be very aware that uh, they're hurting for me. That's tough for you were 19. That's that's really difficult to process at any age. But especially you, you, you haven't even, you're still a teenager. You're not even... Yeah. Um, you're not, you haven't even hit 20 yet. Yeah. And so I saw that and it was, and, and, and it was these brief moments between like going back under. And so uh, the crazy thing about being in, in like a, a coma or in a medically induced coma or anything like that is um, it's not like dreaming. It's not like you are essentially passing time. And so you live in your unconscious your subconscious and what you wind up doing is you start working through a narrative it's almost like jumping into your favorite tv show but having a little bit more control in a sense um and, and so i had this experience of like living out my life and then i get jolted back into reality only to see these people that i love in pain and then it was back in and then uh, I remember they would they put me into a hyperbarics chamber, which is a decompression chamber. The mm -hmm. idea being if they can lower the pressure, they can manipulate how my body's reacting to it. And the idea being decompressing the uh, the air embolism so it doesn't pop because that was their biggest you know risk. If it pops, I'm a goner in a lot of ways. 
And so I remember being in there for, you know, hours at a time. I remember being in there, they get to the level they want. And keep in mind, like I'm paralyzed. I'm laying on my back in this chamber. And I started having a seizure. I started throwing up. And I uh, had to find every ounce of fight that I had just to turn my head. And the wherewithal, right? To know in that moment, the only thing- Yeah, that you needed to. The only thing, because I was, you know, like I couldn't move. Like I was paralyzed pretty much two-faced. Like my whole left side, which weakened the right side. And so I had to like find every ounce of energy that I had to just turn my head. And think about how much we take that for granted to just be able to look left or right so easily, right? And so um, having the seizure and I just- slow motion, just being able to do that. Um, and I just remember the strength coming from, I don't want my family to hurt. It, it, like it was way beyond me at that point. It was like, you know, it wasn't, uh, I want to just get through this. It was like, it's like, I, I kind of like, I've made my, I'd come to terms with the fact that like I was in a bad spot. Um, yeah. but it was, if I can do something about this and not hurt my family, then I'm going to do that. You know, and that's what got me right. in that sense. And so, I think we forget sometimes how um, grateful we should be for the health of our, not just ourselves, but for the health of our children, yeah. especially when you hear, um, because you were still a very young man, yeah. you know, still, still a child. Yep. Um and we, we take for granted sometimes, like you said, that we have our full mobility, hearing, sight, um, and that our children have that. And we, we forget to be grateful for that. Yeah. Kind of speaking to that point, I was still being seen by pediatric cardiology because the transition had not been made. I, I wasn't seeing an adult cardiologist yet. And so they right. had me in the PICU. So at this point, they've been able to get me to a place where I was out of the the main risk of it bursting, but still now had to go into recovery, you know. And so they put me into the PICU and um, I was still not out of the water. They're like, I was still very much fighting to stay alive because now they take me out of the coma and I was just in like the tremendous pain. Um, the thing about, you know, being paralyzed, it's like, there's a lot of phantom pain. Like you think your arm should work. You think your leg should work. So you're stressing and straining those nerves on top of the fact that like your chest was just ripped open. And then you added this other level of trauma on top of that and trying to uh, really work through that. Um, and, and as long as it's been, you know, I still can lay here right now and uh, they say like pain goes away and stuff, but that, that, that pain has never gone away for me. And it's something that I've certainly been, uh, you know, have dealt with, you know, for my life and not just the pain being in presence, but the memory of how severe that pain was. Um, right. Did you ever have any like PTSD from that? Oh yeah, no, absolutely. This is, this is the root of my PTSD for sure. Uh, in a major Mm way. Well, so they had, um, in the PICU, it was myself and a newborn that was, that had a heart issue. And this baby cried nonstop. Now, um, for most people, that would be an annoyance. But uh, I would lay in bed in tears, listening to that baby cry, fighting for every breath. I can tell you what it's like to fight, to fill your lungs up, hold it, and then let it go. Like I was, I was literally teaching myself to breathe deeply, hold it, because mm-hmm. it was the only way that I knew that I could stay alive. Cause I knew that if I tried to like normally breathe and just rely on my, like, it just, it just wasn't working. Like, uh, you know, I had gotten pneumonia. I had, I mean, like it was just, I was in a bad spot. And so I knew that it was going to be me that had to, to fight it. Like I can, I was relying on the doctors to do their part, but, um, I had to do, you had to do your part too. That's right. Yeah. And so this baby crying, I would lay there in tears because I knew as long as I heard that baby crying, I was alive. And that's, uh, that's that's scary that's that's you know a very sad powerful approach to it but um i'm sitting here right now talking to you about it and i can remember i remember exactly the the cry of that baby um the uh that's the cry for hope you know and and 
it was every breath, every moment, every ounce of strength leaning into that cry for hope. Because that's all I could do. Um, I didn't know if I was going to wake up the next day. I didn't know if I was going to get out of the hospital. I just knew every moment, every tear, every cry, every inhale, every exhale, one at a time. And it breaks you down to such a micro level. It's a very primal nature that we get to. Um, that is the physical type of strength that I do talk about when I talk about being a warrior. Um, right. But it also shows you that when we think about ourselves as warriors and we think, oh, I don't have that. Every single breath that you take is a testament to being a warrior. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and sometimes that's sometimes that's the fight, right? Just like for you, just take it. Sometimes we have to take life at that speed. Just one more breath, just one more breath, just one more breath. And I think that uh, the crazy thing is like, I wasn't even able to like, I didn't even wrap my head around what was really going on at the time either. I was just so caught up in survival. I just, I, you know, it was just this one, this one, this but I knew that I just had to do this next thing, do this one thing. And it was a lot of it was just holding on. But I hadn't even wrapped my head around the fact that I couldn't move. Right. I didn't I didn't comprehend the fact that I couldn't drive, that I wasn't going to be able to do the activities that I like to do. I wasn't going to be a. there was nothing that was going to be normal after that. Um, but I didn't have to face that in the moment. But it quickly flooded in. Right. And I think at 19 years old, um, I was very energetic, very outgoing, very, you know, um, you know, a lot of ways me who I am now turned up to 11, <laughs> like, you know, uh, <laughs> did so, that lead to, did that lead to some depression and anxiety yeah, for yeah, you? So that's where, um, I started to, uh, like, I really went to a dark place and I did develop PTSD. Um, I started having, uh, nightmares, night tremors. I mean, think about being 19 years old, having to sleep on a mattress on your parents' floor, your parents having to pick you up to put you into a tub, uh, take you out, you know, to put you in a wheelchair, to carry you down the stairs to get you into another wheelchair. Friends not really knowing how to be around you. So they kind of shut you out. Uh, and, 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 it, and I don't, it, it was unintentional. I don't, I don't like, you know, fall any blame. Cause you know, I still had a lot of people that showed up, but I also understand, you know, at that time, like at 19, do you really know how to be there for somebody who is, you know, going through some real shit? Like, um, I remember, uh, the girl that I was dating at the time just saying, I can't do this. And like, I remember being angry and hurt, but I get it. I get it more now, obviously, but yeah, uh, I think I got it then too. But, you know, those things have a toll on you. You know, you, you're you laying around all day in a ton of pain. You're on pain medicine. You, you Your life kind of stops. Yeah. You know, like, I was in college. I had to drop out of college. I, I didn't know what the next chapter was going to be. I didn't know if I was going to be live long enough to even plan anything. Um, and then I would have these horrendous dreams, these nightmares of uh, the doctor walking into the house, walking up the stairs, standing over me with the scalpel, cutting my chest and taking my heart out. Yeah. Every night, sweats, tremors, uh, that that pain was going to be with me forever. Um, people I, forget that people forget that when you go through something that's physically traumatic, that it can also have a a deep effect on your brain, on your mind. It's embedded into uh, like our neuroplasty. It, it becomes who we are in a lot of ways. Um, mm -hmm. And then I started having nightmares. Um, and, and then I got really confused all the time. Like, remember I was in this coma for a long time and I'd felt like I'd already lived parts of my life. And so I would get just really confused a lot. Like, well, didn't I already do that? Or didn't I already, you know, wasn't it already my birthday? Wasn't it, you know, like these things, um, and it just sent me into this really, uh, weird spiral. Um, right. I would imagine that the pain medicine would probably keep you, um, 
in a spot where you were confused, bewildered, everything is kind of fuzzy, you lose track of time. When you're in pain like that, uh, people don't understand that really and truly living outside of that is almost impossible. Yeah. And I think that it's uh, what it makes you become is just very, uh, very numb. Mm -hmm. You know, I think that that whole experience made me numb. Like the one thing that I will say through all of my experiences is I've never been bitter. I've never been a why me. I've just kind of, you know, just taken it. But I think the caveat to that is like, um, we we then tend to become like a martyr. And, yeah. You know, you, you start to praise your victimhood as martyrdom and which could be equally as unhealthy, right? Well, you know, if it's going to happen to anyone, it could just happen to me because I'm strong enough. And that, that was kind of like the, that was on, that was my mantle. That was, you know, where, where I kind of saw it. And so I didn't really recover because I don't think I ever really recover from that stuff um but what i did was i normalized right I, I created my sense of worth around you know being able to get through things you know i was right of adversity uh you wouldn't have luck if you didn't have you know bad luck kind of like, <laughs> um and i just kind of went into the world you know i um would get a job, I get frustrated, I get stressed, and I became like that revolver, never knowing where to go, what I was doing, because I didn't really, I, I didn't allow myself to be who I was. It was always playing safe to the point of not really fully engaging with me. It was just enough to where I was within arm's reach of anything that was going to hurt me, any big risk, any big chance, challenge. And so I would take these jobs that were kind of safe. I would do good. And then as soon as it started getting a little stressful, I would kind of scurry off, you know. Were you um, were you working with like a pain management um, therapist or any type of therapist? Off and on, yes. And then... Um, a couple of years go by and I got a pretty decent job, you know, worked in the restaurant industry, met um, my daughter's mom. You know, we got married and um, right after my daughter was born, I started having some health issues again. And I think that kind of like, you know, really good kind of segue to could this, uh, you know, because I, I did have like, you know, I kept I got back to like some normalcy post, you know, surgery at 19, you know, went through my early years, tried going back to college, realized that's not working out. Uh, so I would, I would do these, you know, decent paying jobs, but like, I just kind of was like, well, you'll just be a college dropout and you'll, you'll take what you can get and just, you know, suffice, but very much from a negative space. I was very hard on myself. Right. You know, it's still something that, you know, uh, I've, I've worked through and continue to work on is, you know, giving myself that grace so that I'm not, you know, victimizing myself. Um, to so go again, back a little, I had a question for you. Yeah, go when your ex-wife was pregnant, were you worried that your daughter might have the, some of the complications that you had? Yeah. So we, uh, we were able to get it pretty clear early on that she was going to be fairly normal, but, uh, you know, I kind of moved around with her, you know, we, we kind of moved state to state to state. My daughter, uh, like we had a lot of stresses our first year of marriage. My daughter was born and then she had jaundice and had to go back into the hospital. And so that crushed me, even though like jaundice is very easily controllable. You know, she was mm -hmm. on the Billy blanket. We got sent home with the UV uh, tray and all that stuff. Okay. But um, as somebody who dealt with pediatric illness, um, it definitely Scary. triggered the idea that like your child is not going to be healthy and all these fears. And I went into complete worry wart, complete, like everything was about like, it was just like my anxiety was like ramped up. And so um, at that point, um, so stress always manifests itself in a very physical way for me. Obviously with my mm -hmm. heart, I have to be very smart about how I decompress and how I work through stress management. And so my daughter was born, um, going through all the stress and my heart just started having some issues again. And so at that point I started working with a pain management at that point and going, you know, and really 
therapy as an adult, uh, you know, and really it's something that I should have like done, kept up with. Uh, but I was in, I was trying to, you know, I was disassociating. I was being very delusional in that, uh, I could control and fix and just create the reality. Uh, all the things that I've learned that we can, but we got to do it the right way. Um, right. And so, and it goes to, sh- and it goes to show also how the, the link between your physical, your physical health and your mental health. Absolutely. Yeah. And so, I started going through that. And then with the pain management, they recognized that like I was having a lot of issues with like inflammation and all these things. So I had to have these three procedures done to where they, um, they put these like rods through your back into your chest cavity. And it's supposed to do like lidocaine, like morphine. Um, and, and so it like, it helps with the pain stuff, but it also helps with the inflammation. And so I had to have that done and I went out on work, uh, from work because I couldn't function at work. I was a restaurant manager working like 70 hours a week. Um, yeah. And it was just putting way too much stress on my body. So new baby, you know, these health issues and stuff. And so, um, started seeing the the demise of my marriage, you know, on top of that, because it's hard to be this strong rock amidst, you know, so much turmoil. Um, yeah. And, you know, we wound up moving, uh, out of state cause my, uh, couldn't work you know so we moved uh out of state to be close to her family and shortly after you know we wound up separating i stayed up there which made it you know all the more hard uh and then i started having health issues up there my heart i went into a heart failure um and it was scary because at that point in my life i had re uh captured the health i'd lost the weight i was doing everything that i could do and um, I still was getting sick. So I made the hard choice to move back to North Carolina on my own. Um, but it was crazy um, how we can say these things to ourselves and it becomes fact. So um, I remember having this thought and it was in uh, 2010. At the end of 2009, 2010 area. Um, you're going to spend the next 10 years in a drought. That's a, that's, that's something that when you tell yourself that you can actually make come true, but you haven't been in a drought the last well, 10 years. No, I did from 2010 to 2000 and, like that, that, that's what happened. Uh, I got separated and spent the next 10 years, uh, doing things the wrong way. It was cause it was the, uh, you, you like the words that were coming up. You don't deserve success. You don't deserve love. You, you, you can't have all these things that you want. Um, so give up, you just give up, you know, um, and, 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 and it walked the line, but, always like, you know, it was like something kept me going steadfast. And it was that strength that I found at seven years old. You're meant for more. It's the strength that I put on display at 19 years old that dude, you, you can literally make your body breathe. (laughs) You can get there. Right. And so what I wound up doing was, um, getting help and really working through for 10 years. It took me to uh, work through the process of dealing with my PTSD yeah, that was a lot of trauma to unpack. Yeah, and I think, you know, it's it's recognizing um what's in, what's what's just real anxiety in the moment, what's depression that's environmental versus conditional. Uh what is right. what is the what is what's rooted in the narrative that you're the lies that you're telling yourself uh versus, you know, this is something you just got to process. And in all those things um it took me a long time to do that work. And I still wasn't even in a place to do the things that I wanted to do. I was just kind of wandering kind of aimlessly, but you know, I, I, what I wound up doing was finding a lot of solace in, and love and connection in serving others. But uh, I was doing it from a place that in, in uh, hindsight was, was probably unhealthy. 
you know, uh, I spent a good part of the time. And really, it's kind of when uh, when we started working together, um, I was serving others to focus on others and not myself. Uh, right. It's kind of what we talk about, like, you know, about, you know, you can't serve from an empty cup. Well, I served from an empty cup for 10 years and really for about five or six. And um, that's where the the kind of like that. The growth that we'll kind of go into next week. Uh, cause I, I don't want to dive too much because there's a lot to unpack with getting from the point of being ready to actually making the work, uh, possible. Right. Um, and I think that that's, that's a, a good place for us to, to kind of wrap as far as there, as far as timeline goes. Um, but I think that there's a lot that we talked about today that we could still probably talk about. Yeah. And, and I wanted to make the point that sometimes people will ask you, um, you know, when you lose someone, when you go through something traumatic when something happens to you and they'll say, well, how do you get over it? How do you get over grief or how do you get over all these things? And unfortunately, the truth is you just have to work through it. Time. The longer you yeah. push it to the side and you ignore it, you're going to act out in a manner that is not healthy, ignoring it, running from it. And it's always going to be there and you're never going to reach that. You're never going to reach that pinnacle where you can begin living your life again until you go through it and you work through it. And it's just unfortunate. There isn't an easy way to do it. You have to put yeah. the work in. So when I was 19, after my stroke, um, I had a friend give me a book um, that changed my life. It was uh, it's uh, Siddhartha. Um, I don't know if you've ever read it or not, but uh, it's yes. essentially the one. several times actually. Yeah, yeah. So it's actually part of my like continued reading. Like I'll I'll pick it up. I can. I mean, I've read it literally probably hundreds of times. Um, I've bought and given away copies of it so many times because it is a monumental book for me. And it's uh, no matter what you believe, you know, it's the walk of the Buddha. But it really helps recognize um, the power of self. While also identifying the, uh, you know, that that selflessness is not a negative thing. It, it, in fact, it's like a uh, a value of energy. It's it's not displacement as much as it is like awareness. Uh, and I need and to going back to last week, what we talked about with uh, a little bit with Beth was um, the power of words. Right. Mm -hmm. This a uh, symbol. Siddhartha is not. A long book. It's no, not very no, long. An easy read. But yeah, but just those words crafted in that manner had such an impact on you. Oh, it's a beautiful and, book. Yeah. Yeah. And we can do that for ourselves. We can create a narrative that of words that can be powerful for us internally, rather, I mean, in addition to things that we read externally. Yeah. And I'll tell you, I've read Siddhartha a couple of different times. And every time I read it, I find something new. Absolutely. Absolutely. And then um, when I got separated, um, I became an avid reader and I took that time to be, uh, I, I took that. So I was, uh, yeah, I'll share this. Uh, when I was, uh, I, I was with uh, my church in the, uh, you know, I was in the Catholic church for a number of years. Um, and I remember going to, you know, talking to a uh, priest and, you know, I was torn up about the fact that I was getting divorced. Um, you know, and I expected, I expected some condemnation, you know? Um, and, and this is not the faith as a whole. This is not to talk down about the Catholic church or to criticize, or, you know, I had one experience with one person and I'm aware enough to say, you know, this doesn't, you know, their response was, well, sometimes you just got to like stop loving somebody. And in the moment, as somebody who was just like not prepared or ready, um, it was probably some of the worst advice I've ever heard in my life. <laughs> and, and, and sometimes bad advice from the right source almost does more damage than, you know, or more impact than good advice from the wrong source. You know what I mean? Right. Uh, and, and, and so it really like challenged me. I was like, well, that's not what I thought or I believed, you know, it's like, you know, right. 
And like, I get the sentiment, right? Like you can let go of people, but the thought of like, just, well, sometimes you got to like stop loving somebody. I'm like, oh, okay. I didn't know Jesus said that, but okay. Right. <laughs> and know? it's actually true, right? <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and, and so, uh, you know, so the, the, that really motivated me to do uh, my own soul searching. And I started right. reading a ton about like different religious texts and, you know, experimenting with like, what do I believe? Um, and really helping myself get to this place of like a strong spiritual foundation. Um, and I think it's something that we do over our life. You know, that that's one of those things you don't just solve, you know, but I read this book called uh, Facing Your Giants by Max Lucado. Um, and again, it's one of those books. It's, it's like on my top five made an impact in my life. Um, and the premise of this book is really following the story of David, um, and using the example of like, you know, this, the shepherd boy who became like a king of men and, and you could replace king of men with warrior and it'd still hold weight. And the idea being that, um, David walked into a battle surrounded by soldiers with armor and shields uh, facing off against Goliath, this giant of a man. Um, and he walked in his stride with his satchel and his slingshot, and just picked up three stones almost casually and with confidence and slayed the giant. Now, it wasn't so much that he just did this miraculous feat in that sense as much as without recourse, without even knowing how he was going to slay the giant without stopping to get a sword, without stopping to do all these things. He walked with confidence that, the, that he was going to face that giant. And so that that's the premise of, you know, when we look at fear, um, oftentimes when we run away from fear, all it does is amplify the fear and make it so that when we do have to face it, which eventually we have to face it, it makes it uh, 10 times bigger and it makes it a greater giant than if we run towards it in battle because we are well equipped to face our fears already. I was going to say, the only person we have us, to convince is us. Yeah. I was going to say, there's two things that, 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 that story can also teach you. And that is one think out of the box. Right. Yeah. Uh, right. And then two, that you already have inside of you, what it takes to be a warrior. And you can do that with what you have right now. Right. Whatever is with you, you have the power to, to be a warrior. You don't, you don't have to have a shield and a sword and armor. You can take what you have right now and you can think outside of the box and you can, you can slay that giant, that giant. Right. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. And I think that that was uh, for me exactly what I needed in the time that I needed it. Mm -hmm. You know, and then, you know, I, I was introduced to, um, you know, the world of metaphysics, you know, I, I reread Aristotle's metaphysics, um, and really started diving into an understanding meditation and, uh, transcendental meditation and yoga and really trying to learn to be one with myself. Um, I attempted very poorly to interpret and, and, and read, uh, even in translation, the Quran and the Torah, uh, which I would love to, at some point, you know, to, to be able to get my headspace to do that. Cause I think that, you know, the, the intent behind these, these scriptures are, you know, for uh, fulfillment of like, you know, awareness of higher powers. And so I don't see it as like this, uh, this blasphemous like approach to, to explore. Oh no. Um, I think, you know, I, I, my goal is always to, you know, it's that thirst for knowledge of enlightenment. Um, cause I, I want to be able to come to the table and, and have a voice, but I think it's important, important to do the due diligence to know what I'm talking about, or at least to, to, you know, to know what I believe in, to have an opinion, to have a conversation. And so, um, these moments of self-discovery and awareness come from shedding that banner of being the king of adversity you know, and really, you know, at least at this point in my life, recognizing that I was strong enough uh, and that and that's about as far as I knew. I was like, I knew I can get through it, um, but it was always uh, 
and really more importantly, I think recognizing the patterns like, oh, no, there's a lot of things that are going wrong in my life. But I, can, I started to at least recognize that they were going wrong. Right. And, uh, that's, a, that's a first step, I suppose. You know, I'm not where, you know, recognizing that I'm saying that I'm not good enough, recognizing that I'm saying I don't deserve love, recognize that I'm saying I don't deserve your success. Because um, some people don't even recognize that they're saying that. Right. Well, it's true across the board, no matter no matter what issue you're talking about to solve an issue, you first have to recognize that there is one. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and I think that the key and maybe like one of the walkaway points, because like obviously we spent, you know, the last hour with me talking about just like really my health stuff, you know, started talking about like some of the real world implications. I think the key to remember, like you we kind of talked a little about grief a little bit there, um, is that I don't compare tragedies. And and like my goal is for nobody to like. Right. These, these are these are my trauma, my tragedies. But what is monumental for me is, is, is a very interpersonal journey. For some people, the most tragic thing that they'll ever deal with is losing a loved one. For some, the most tragic thing is divorce. For some, it is, you know, losing a job. You know, we can't counterweight our hurt. Like your hurt right. is no more or less important than mine. And mine is no more or less important than yours. It's, it's our pain. It's our, it's our tragedy. It's, you know, where, where the power of that comes is what we do with it. And I think it's just really important for me to, to make sure that, that people do recognize that. Like I, I'm not going on this hour long diatribe to glorify the pain or to try to, uh, you know, what I don't want and what I don't like. And, and when I was, when I would go and do like, um, speaking when I was, when I was doing that, um, is, you know, I don't say it for pity and I don't say it to get you into a place of comparison. Oh, your life is so much harder. Well, no, your life is, you know, they're, they're equally hard. Pick your heart. Right. <laughs> you know, it's like, you know, you're still dealing with your level of heart. Uh, and I think that that's wisdom that I've learned over the years that, you know, it's not uh, that I have this this triumph of tragedy. It's what I've been able to accomplish and get through. We all do. And and I'm very much looking forward to next week where we can uh, dissect that and really kind of go into how I went from being able to say, you're not good enough. You don't deserve love. You are never going to be successful you know, you have this, this issue, these, these patterns are going to continue to somebody who years later can stand here and proclaim like, and I love my life. Like, love it. <laughs> I love the hardships. I love the lessons. I love the opportunities. Um, and I, I love how it's playing out. Um, and I, it's hard work to get to that point. Yeah. I mean, I love me first and foremost, and then by loving me, I can say, I do deserve success. I do deserve love. I am worth it because I meant for more. Hey, Warriors, it's Michael. And I want to thank you for listening to the Warrior of Impact podcast. Make sure that you subscribe to us on your favorite streaming platforms and leave us a five-star review. For more information, check out warrioropact.com.